You set foot on foreign soil. Only this land isn't ruled by any country or government. In this land we celebrate music. In this land we celebrate games. In this land we celebrate those who compose video game music. Welcome to the VG Embassy. Embassy. Welcome and thanks for tuning in to another episode of the VG Embassy. This is a show centered around video game music and the amazing online community of fans and podcasters that enjoy it. My name's Ed, and on each episode I'll take the role of Prime VGM Minister and invite a guest VG Ambassador onto the show to share with us their own video game music culture. Or, like today, I'll be sharing a part of my own culture on a solo show. Hello again, friends. It has been a little while. It's been, uh, you know, a couple months since the Papriam show, but I am back and on a delayed release date, as I mentioned earlier. Getting back in the swing of things, hoping we can bring the Patreon back, bring the Embassy exclusive shows back, you know, get back into the uh, traditional VG Embassy launch cycle pretty soon. As it is now, though, my life is still pretty tied up in COVID stuff and lots of other things that have been putting podcasting on hold. Anyways, I did mention that the shows that would be coming out during this delayed release cycle would be shows that were very important to me. And this is a show that I have been wrestling with releasing for a long, long time. To be honest, I originally pitched this show while we were doing Pixel Tunes Radio, and uh, got shot down because it wasn't VGM enough. And I pitched this show to Brian when I was doing Impulse Project and got shot down because it wasn't demo scene enough. (laughs) It's a little bit in between. And so I think this is the perfect opportunity to do it because I make my own rules and I can't shoot myself down. So here we are. Today, I'm going to be sharing the soundtrack to a game called Break Quest. And the interesting thing about this game is that all of the music in the game is previously written demo scene music. So that's where the lines kind of blur a little bit. It wasn't originally intended as video game music, and now it's a video game soundtrack. So shows that are dedicated to one or the other, it's like, well, does it, does it really, does it really fit? I don't care. The music is phenomenal. I think you're going to be wowed by the quality of these tunes. You're going to hear all sorts of genres, uh, all sorts of unique styles of music, some that don't even classify genre, and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. I first discovered this game quite a long time ago. I don't even remember how. It's a Windows game that also got released for the PSP via the PSP Minis branding that they had going on for a little while, quick downloadable games. It was released originally on November 16th, 2004, by a small Spanish game studio called Nurium Games. Nurium Games is so small that it's made of only one person, Felix Casablancas. He started the company on January 1st, 2004 at his home in Barcelona. He grew up playing games on the ZX Spectrum. He became an IT tech later on in life, and he decided to leave the IT world specifically to create Break Quest. So in July of 2005, after its initial release, Red Marble Games ported and released the game for Mac OS. And then five years later in 2009, Beat Shapers released a digital-only PSP port of the game as part of the European PSP Go launch, with the game releasing a year later in 2010 in the North American markets. In 2016, Felix graciously declared that the PC port of the game would be free to everyone and released a universal activation key on his website. So you can go download it now and start playing as soon as this podcast is done. 
We'll talk a little bit more about the game itself as the show progresses, but we're a game music podcast, and that's why you're all here, I'm assuming. (laughs) So the reason that this game is both video game music and demo scene music is because Felix, with permission from the original artists, used existing music from Dutch demo scene group Maniacs of Noise to score his game. The group was founded by demo scene legends Charles Deenan and Euro Intel in 1987, and their website claims they are the first video game music company in the world. So around the time of this game's release in 2004, Maniacs of Noise had three members, Eurointel, a.k.a. Wave, Thomas Peterson, a.k.a. Laxity, and Thomas Mogensen, a.k.a. Drax. BreakQuest's soundtrack features compositions by all three members, but the vast majority of the music is from Drax. So that's who we're going to be focusing on mostly today. It's also no coincidence that Drax is one of my favorite demo sceners and composers. I've mentioned that several times on Impulse Project, if you were a listener of that show, and I've shared several pieces of music from him. And uh, this is kind of how I got into demo scene music, and Drax's music became kind of like the benchmark by which I compare all other demo scene tunes, just because I was so enveloped in his music, I guess, by by just playing this game. These artists have composed music for many different game systems, from the ZX Spectrum all the way up to streaming audio on modern consoles. But all of the music in Break West is played by a built-in Fast Tracker 2 player. These are pieces of music composed in a tracker format, but without the sample size limitations of like standard Amiga mods and with up to 32 individual channels of music. So for comparison, our dear friend the SNES with its SPC 700 sound system had eight channels of sampled audio with sample size and bitrate limitations on each of those channels. This is 32 channels, so it's like smooshing four Super Nintendo sound chips together and eliminating the sample size limitation. The sky's the limit, more or less, when you're composing on this thing. There are over 30 pieces of music in this game. I've chosen around 15, but uh, we're going to start at the top, for the top of the show. We're going to listen to the title screen music. So, first up is No Expectations, which is a song by Drax. This was written in 2001. So, let's take a listen, and we'll be right back.
right, folks, that was No Expectations, composed by Drax in 2001 and later included in the 2004 game Break Quest. I can't listen to this song without picturing the title screen of the game. And it sounds like a great title screen theme, too, even though it wasn't originally composed to be one. So I think as we go through the show, uh, we're going to hear a lot of songs that maybe might not seem so traditionally VGM. And that's honestly because, you know, this music wasn't really intended as such. But I think we'll also hear a lot of songs that you can listen to and be like, oh, yeah, I can definitely hear this as being part of a of a video game. Some of the music in this game was used for specific events. And I'll kind of point those out as we go throughout the show. But a lot of the music in this game was... I'm not going to say randomly scattered, but you'll hear it multiple times as you progress. I really enjoy this one. There are uh, four distinct parts. There's the percussion. There's the rhythm synth, which is kind of a little bit arpeggiated and just kind of drives along. There's the fantastic leads with some great solos. Very, very playful, almost childlike solos. They're a lot of fun to listen to. And then the bass line. And I love Drax's bass lines. They complement the song so well. They don't just blindly follow along with the traditional chords of the rhythm section or the, you know, the rhythm keys. He's really, really good at writing engaging and fun bass lines. So you'll hear a lot of that in here. And I, I like the fact that it's called No Expectations because you should not have any when you're listening to the music on this show. You're going to hear, like I said before, all sorts of different genres. The great thing about Fast Tracker is that you can load up whatever samples you want per song. This isn't like we're going to be listening to a Super Nintendo game where you will load in your samples for the game and you have to compose every single piece of music with those samples. So we're going to hear lots of different kinds of music, lots of different moods, lots of different tempos. It's going to be fun. The cool thing about these songs being Fast Tracker 2 files as well is that they are all just kind of plopped in the game's file system. So if you download the game, you can just peruse the folders uh, that come with the PC game and pick out all of these mod files and play them in your mod player. Or you can download the, uh, if you're a FUBAR 2000 user, which is a fairly popular music player for PC and Mac, you can download the uh, OpenMPT component for FUBAR, and that will give you native playback for these tracks and all other Fast Tracker 2 files, so you can listen to it right in your standard music player. But if you listen to it in Fast Tracker 2, Open MPT, you're able to see inside the music file, as it were. And you can see all the comments, you can see the patterns and all the, the trackers. You can even edit the songs if you want to. I would never go so far as to disgrace or defile these amazing pieces of music myself. But if you wanted to, say, raise the volume, solo a couple channels out to listen to a particular part, like the bass line or the drums, you're free to do that in OpenMPT. So it's really, really cool that you can take music out of a video game and kind of play with it like this. The other cool thing is that the Fast Tracker 2 format and, and most modern mod formats allow the composer to write their own notes inside the music. So I'll be sharing those as we play the music. If there's anything significant that the composer wanted to share about the song, etc., etc. So the notes for this one reads, This module is dedicated to my friend Klaus, who turned 25 earlier this year. I'm sorry this present is delayed a little bit. So this song was originally written as a birthday present for a friend, which I think is really cool, especially the playful nature of this. Like, it's a very celebratory track, and that really, really comes through on this composition. Also, usually with Drax compositions, if you scroll all the way down the notes section, he'll, like, thank a whole bunch of, like, friends, family members, etc., do some greets, and at the very bottom, he'll usually put when exactly he wrote these tunes. And in this case, this song was started and completed on May 25th, 2001. So dude sat down one day and just banged out this whole track beginning and end. That's 
pretty freaking cool. He's um he's very talented and a very fast worker. You'll see that as we go throughout the show. Some of these songs take like a day or two, and I'm honestly, from the complexity of them, I'm surprised that he's able to do so much work in so little time. Before we move on to the next track, let's talk a little bit about the type of game that we are featuring here. Maybe for a little more context as far as uh, what you're doing while you're listening to this music. So Break Quest is a breakout style game, and that means you control an object at the bottom of the screen, usually called a bat or a paddle, and it's responsible for keeping a small projectile in play, and that bounces off objects at the top of the screen in order to remove them from the field. In most cases, the current level ends when all the objects at the top of the screen have been removed and the next level will begin. So if you're familiar with Breakout, if you're familiar with uh, any Breakout clones that are out there, you will be very familiar with this game. If the projectile that you're bouncing off of the objects at the top of the screen happens to miss your paddle and fall to the bottom of the screen, you lose a life, you get a new ball, you start bouncing it, if you lose all your balls, as it were, you get a game over. I was fortunate to own the original Breakout on the Atari 2600 as a kid, so that was one of my favorite games. And uh, so I feel like I have a really good appreciation for Breakout games because I really understand like the roots, like how simple it was originally. And I got good at Breakout on the Atari 2600, so it's a great kind of... Uh, you get that little kid muscle memory, you know, so I tend to kind of like cruise through breakout games really easily. This one was a good challenge. So the other cool thing about on the Atari 2600 days is they had analog controls. They had a, it's called a paddle. You just hold it in one hand and there's a dial that you turn with the other hand and a little button for your, for your thumb. And so you could control very precisely the bat or paddle at the bottom of the screen. It got a lot more difficult when you were doing it on the NES or the PS1, where before analog controllers were made, uh, it made it really hard. So with most PC breakout games, you will use the mouse to move back and forth and, uh, and bounce your ball back and forth. Most breakout games use, you know, basic math and geometry to calculate the root of the ball and the angles it will take during a ricochet. It almost always goes in an exact diagonal line, will bounce off a wall and, you know, ricochet off at a at a perfect angle. Break Quest uses a fully featured physics engine called Dynamo to enhance its gameplay. So because of this, the blocks that you're trying to hit will dangle realistically from wires, they'll get flung around on carousels, they'll bounce and bump into each other, and they create really chaotic situations. The physics engine in this game is what makes the game so cool because there's an element of no expectations, just like we uh, just listened to. You can't always predict what the ball will do when it hits something because that block might have different physics properties. It might be a little more bouncy. It might absorb your ball and plop it back at you at a different rate. It might swing around on a pendulum and knock your ball on its second swing back as the ball returns to you. It gets pretty freaking crazy. And I think that's what makes it feel so modern. Like even though this game was released in 2004, I still play it today and it still feels fresh and impressive. Very, very impressive for the type of game that it is. Uh, As far as the plot goes, there's not too much going on with it. Uh, Verbatim from the website, it reads, A huge corporation rules the world by making thousands of TV channels and shows for people to watch. Everyone becomes addicted, starting the destruction of human intelligence. The player has to put up a transmitter to stop the satellite signals and end the corporation's rule. So it's a little commentary on humanity getting lazy. Reminds me kind of of uh, like WALL-E or something like that. I think it's funny because... This is where everybody thought things were going. And, uh, you know, so many channels and oh my God, you know, we're just kind of glued to the TV all the time. Now, television channels don't mean much. Like everybody's doing on demand and Netflix and stuff. It's a different kind of addiction, but I think putting up a satellite to get rid of TV stations is, is maybe a little bit of a dated way to end capitalism. <laughs> Anywho, all right, so. Let's move on to our next track. And uh, we'll go through a couple quickly. And uh, then we will talk a little bit about how the 
soundtrack was used in the game, talk a little bit about Drax himself, and maybe share some music from the other two members of Maniacs of Noise whose compositions appear in this game. So, up next is a track called Burning Bridges, again, written by Thomas Mogensen in 2003. Let's hit it. Oh man, Drax, bring in the funk. That was Burning Bridges, composed amazingly between the 28th and 29th of May, 2003. Two days. Wow. Anywho, man, you know, I was going to tell you at the beginning of the show, but I should probably just tell you now anyways, if you've got, you know, whatever you're listening to this show on, if you've got some EQ available to you, pump up the bass a little bit. You're really going to want to experience Mr. Mogensen's bass lines, especially in this track. It's so good. Uh, this is great composition, too, because it, it, it almost has a chorus verse chorus feel to it, even though it's an instrumental. But I like in the, the quote unquote verse sections, it always resolves with that kind of brassy section bump 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 ba da ba da bump ba it's so 70s like it's really authentic sounding synth funk if there is such a thing but i definitely get disco vibes punk vibes from this there's a lot of really cool instruments too there's a even like a tight it's like a record scratch or kind of like a it almost sounds like a squeaky door kind of hanging out in the left channel a little bit just kind of adding a little bit to the percussion there's so many little touches and tweaks in his music that bring them to life 
and he waits until like the end. So he funks a little bit, you know. He's got he's got some arpeggiations going on and some like you know little staccato free notes here and there, and then he waits until the very end to throw in some noodly solos, which is kind of like the trademark of what he does too. This honestly reminds me a lot of Trevin Hughes' work, aka Dread. You know, we just featured him last episode on the Paprium show, but very funky, very groovy, a lot of really nice bass runs, cool solos. I, I, I notice a lot of similarities between the two composers, probably why I enjoy both of their music so much. So, uh, Dread, if you're listening, I hope I hope you enjoy this show. If you're not familiar with Drax, he might uh, offer you some inspiration as far as music goes. Anyhow, uh, as far as uh, the notes for this particular file goes, it's it's pretty simple. It says composed and arranged by Thomas Mogensen, aka Drax. Some greetings to his family and the other members of Maniacs of Noise. And then, of course, at the bottom, this tune was written between the 28th and 29th of May, 2003. All right, so let's jump right in to the next piece of music think you all are going to enjoy this one as well. This one is called Quick Step. This one's a little bit older. This one was written in 1997, although I think you'll see that even though this was earlier in his musical career, it doesn't mean that he was any less talented or capable of writing excellent tunes. Thank you. 
All right, that was Quick Step, written in 1997 by Drax. One of his oldest tunes on the soundtrack, but you would never know it. Again, this was written in one day on June 30th, 1997. I feel like this one has a very late 80s, early 90s feel, which I guess kind of makes sense. This was written around the late 90s and video game music and demo scene music always tended to kind of follow a little bit behind musical trends. So this one would kind of align with that. I think the, I'm gonna call them verses and choruses again, but the, the, the setup kind of feels like a Paula Abdul, Janet Jackson kind of a tune. And then when that chorus part comes in, ba 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 da da, it has a gosh, I don't know, Huey Lewis in the news, or maybe a very uh, like one of Prince's jazzier tunes, kind of a feel to it. Very uplifting, again, very brassy. He really likes that stuff. It feels really good. And then about two minutes in like 30 seconds before the song ends, it gets really ethereal. Like everything kind of raises and you get these crickety sounds that are like sweeping from the right to the left channel. And things feel much more layered and textured. I really like that part. And I wish it would go on for a little bit longer, but then he just loops it right back into the beginning of the song and, and makes you want to listen to it all over again. So it was really cool. I really like this track. One of the other interesting things in the liner notes is that he lists his home address and his phone number with a note to contact him for music commissions or contracts. Can you imagine doing that nowadays, just putting a piece of whatever out on the web and attaching your home address and your phone number to it? Different world, I guess. The internet was a much, much smaller place in 1997, and the BBSs and forums that these tracks were being shared on was an even smaller population, and probably a very tight-knit population, so maybe giving out that information wasn't that uh, unsafe as it was. And hey, you know, tapping on your temple, nobody can dox you if you already have given out your information, right? There you go. You got to beat the uh, the jerks at their own game. So let's move on to our next track. Let's change up the mood a little bit with an absolutely sultry tune. This one's called Solitaire. This was written again by Thomas Mogensen, a.k.a. Drax, in the futuristic year 2000. Be right back.
Mamma mia, I gotta take a breath. Hold on a second. Ugh. That was Solitaire from Drax, written in 2000. Um, yeah, I can't listen to that song without feeling whatever Drax was feeling (laughs) himself when he wrote this. How do you sequence music but simultaneously make it sound so emotional I'm, I'm gathering by the name of the tune Solitaire that this is a track about loneliness and about maybe the sadness that comes with being lonely it feels so wistful it, there's no percussion whatsoever and it's just a little bit of of chimes and that just like i said before sultry lead synth which i think it apes a guitar pretty well i think i could see like you know steve vai standing on a rocky cliff in the sunset with wind in his hair just kind of soloing out this thing with a tear running down his face and then for accentuation some some broad synths come in and just kind of wash downward during some of the more intense note runs really really good stuff i said at the beginning of the show you know to expect different genres to expect different styles i think this this especially following some of the more funkier and upbeat tunes we've just listened to should really give you a good idea of just how talented thomas mogensen is and just how versatile he can compose such good stuff and it's so weird playing a breakout game to a track like this it just feels like i don't know i want to cry but i'm also really (laughs) getting (laughs) into this intense game at the same time this is a pretty good place to talk about how the game is set up and how the music is used because this music stands out in my mind particularly because of how it's used and and how different it sounds from a lot of the other music on the soundtrack. So the game features 100 unique levels. And I mean, like, truly unique. Each level has an entirely different art style, an entirely different color palette, new sets of items and destructibles and different physics for every single one. The only things that remain the same are your paddle, which looks like a spaceship, the power-ups that you get, and your ball. Your ball is just a white sphere with a black kind of cel-shaded outline. And uh, the items that you can get look like kind of like teardrops, I guess. And they're your kind of typical breakout items. Uh, They can make your ball faster. They can give you a multi-ball. The old ball will split into three different balls. They have to kind of like juggle. Um, They'll make your paddle wider or smaller. It'll change the shape. You can get one that, like, makes it seem like your paddle is on ice and it kind of slips and slides back and forth. There's a drunk ball power-up, which makes your ball kind of waver back and forth like it was a drunk driver. There are some really creative ones, but all those power-ups remain the same throughout the entire game. But as different as all of the levels are, there are some levels that have, like, similar feelings or themes. As an example, Solitaire usually plays during levels that have some sort of fire or heat element to them. Like, one level might have you breaking apart a like a cel-shaded pixel art image of the devil. Uh, another one might be, like, in the desert somewhere. Another one might be, like, inside a furnace. I really do applaud the music selection choice for each of the levels in the game, even though some of them repeat, because each one really complements the visuals that you're seeing on the screen nicely, and it really enhances the feeling of the game. So, while it's nice and toasty all up in here, let's listen to one more track that keeps the temperature quite high. We're going to listen to a track called Baked Beams. That's with an M as in Mary. This was written by Drax one year later in 2001.
All right, that was Baked Beams by Drax, written in 2001. Did you guys hear it? Did you guys hear the motif? Da 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 da. He does that in No Expectations as well a couple of times. These songs feel like they're paired together. They were both written in 2001, so it makes sense that maybe he had that little run on his mind and kind of composed these two tracks as compliments to each other. This one feels a lot darker. Uh, like I said, a lot more toasty. It has kind of a Middle Eastern or like an Egyptian vibe to it. There are a bunch of levels in this game that do involve like pyramids or hieroglyphs, and you'll hear this track play in those levels, I think, because of that. But then at the end, he decides to just get super duper funky. And uh, I'm not sure why. I think it, it, it works. I mean, it's just before the end of the track, so it just kind of like gives things a little punch of energy. His later tracks, like 1997, he was like giving out his phone number and his address. He's like, here, come meet me at my house and I'll make you some macaroni and cheese. But later on, his notes get much more sparse. So I don't know if this was another track that he wrote in the course of one day or not. You know, maybe he walked away from the song for a little while and then sat back down and he was like, yeah, maybe I'll do some funk. Although knowing him, he did this all in one day and he was like, that was before lunch and after lunch. I, I don't know. Maybe that macaroni and cheese really put him in a funky mood. Good song though. Again, bass lines are just killer so groovy and it's just so much more than just the backbone of his songs he really uses it to accentuate his percussion i really dig it so let's talk a little bit about drax who is the man that's composing all of these amazing tunes well as i said already his name is thomas mogensen his first handle was actually Wolfman, which he says he's pretty embarrassed about, but that he was only around 12 years old at the time when he started writing music. That's pretty young for a demo scener. Uh, he had a friend, Tiger, from the demo group Noise, and he suggested Drax for him, which he's kept ever since. It was probably a pretty unique name back in the day, and it used to be pretty easy to search for him on Google and get lots of demo scene stuff, but since the popularity of the character Drax, spelled exactly the same way, uh, played by Dave Bautista in the Marvel Comics Universe movies, you Google the name Drax and you'll be lucky if you go like 100 links before actually getting to anything remotely involving Thomas Mogensen. It's a shame. So you really have to kind of like narrow your search down to Drax demo scene or Drax maniacs of noise, something like that in order to, to pull information from the web about him. He first started making music on the Commodore 64 in 1988. He joined the group Vibrance in 1989 as the third member. He composed like almost a thousand tunes on the C64 alone, but he's also composed hundreds of other tunes for other computer formats. He joined Maniacs of Noise in 1996, and he credits his brother Ole for influencing him and getting into the scene. He was a programmer and he worked doing demos, making graphics, composing music, and swapping programs and stuff. So Ole did a little bit of composition and that really caught Thomas's attention. They started using Rob Hubbard's original player and Sound Monitor 1.0, just started noodling around with music and ended up really enjoying it and the other members of noise uh, saw his talent and brought him in to start coding and writing some music for some demos then he went on to a group called bones after a while being a native of denmark and your own tell also being a native of denmark contacted thomas and was like do you want to come and join Maniacs of Noise, and uh, Drax was a huge fan of that group and their work, and uh, he didn't hesitate for a moment. He joined right up, and he's been kind of a member ever since. Maniacs of Noise tends to be just your own and tell at this point, but I don't think Drax ever officially like announced a departure, so most websites will say that he's still a member. However, if you go to the Maniacs of Noise website, it'll pretty much just be your own and tell's work. But anyways, in addition 
to his mind-numbing collection of Commodore 64 songs. He's also composed several hundred pieces of Amiga mod music and its modern derivatives, like we're listening to today. He's from Aalborg, which is a city in northern Denmark, and he's a bona fide video game music composer as well as a demo scene composer. He's written original music for a few Game Boy Color games like Jim Henson's Bear in the Big Blue House, Jay the Lion, and The Land Before Time. Mostly European-only releases, but a couple of them ended up coming out over here as well. Okay, you guys ready for some more music? We'll uh, we'll stick with the themes. We're going from uh, hot and sultry to the opposite, cold and spooky. Sometimes levels have a haunted theme to them. There might be ghosts that you have to hit or avoid, moons hanging in the air, scraggly vines to break apart, monsters flying everywhere. In most of those levels, you will hear a track called Death Wishing Well. This is one of my absolute favorite compositions from Drax. I also featured it on Impulse Project a number of years ago, and I'm sharing it again today. This was written in 2003. Enjoy. Right, that was Death Wishing Well by Drax, written in 2003. 
uh, spooky, but maybe a little like Eastern European or Mediterranean. I don't know. The accordion interlude gives off like a very Romanian gypsy vibe, maybe even a little Italian in there. I don't know. It's got a very European percussion and rhythm section. And then over it, I can just see people like dancing in a field surrounded by wooden trailers or something. I don't know. It's it's interesting how he can blend genres and yet keep the whole thing feeling very cohesive. Like even before this, Big Beams started a little bit kind of industrial-ish and then got kind of Middle Eastern and then ended on funk and it all flowed very well. This one starts really spooky and then gets European and then goes back to spook. Maybe they're just spooky Europeans. Also, I wanted to point out those trills and runs and bends in the lead instrument, which I don't know, I'm just going to call it a spookophone because that's what it sounds like to me. Uh, they're all programmed. He didn't like sample the trill and just drop it in as a sample with his solos. Like they're really tracked manipulations of the notes in the program. It's really cool and it's really fun to kind of watch all of the tracker code go by if you're playing these tracks in OpenMPT. Speaking of which, anyone listening, if you guys want to learn how to play these files, uh, just hit me up on the Discord or reach out to me on Twitter at the VG Embassy and uh, I can send you over like a zip file of all of these tracks. They're all publicly available anyway, like you can go on Mod Archive and download all of the music that I'm sharing, but it's obviously going to be a lot easier if I can just give it to you all in one package. And I can also give you all the other music from this game that I didn't play. Uh, I've got them all on my hard drive, so if you wanted to, um, you know, take a listen yourself and see how these are all tracked out and read the notes, it's fun to get a insight as to how the composer wrote these songs and actually see it being performed in front of your face as you're listening to them. This track was, uh, again, written on one day, May 26th, 2003. By 2003, his notes were getting extremely brief. <laughs> he didn't even list a large collection of people that he wanted to thank. It literally just says, hello to all. It's like, okay, if you know him, then you're thanked. Consider yourself greeted. I thought that was really funny, considering his, his earlier notes sometimes stretch on and on and on. Okay, so let's get out of the heat. Let's get out of the spookiness. Let's enjoy something completely unexpected. Next up is a track called The Unexpected. <laughs> this was written by Drax. I get an older one in 1997.
All right. Thank you for sticking with me on this VG Embassy genre hopping trip. That was the unexpected written by Drax in 1997. Maybe he called it the unexpected because it's not a lot like the other stuff that he's written. It's very rock. Like you don't expect to hear distorted guitars, especially in like a metal kind of chuggy riff uh, from Drax himself. I love the really aggressive arpeggios in this. They are relentless and they are just scaling up and down like crazy. It makes the song feel really aggressive. Even though it's kind of funky in places, it, it really feels like it's rushing towards something. And I like it. It's got a got a dance beat with the guitars over it. Almost kind of reminds me of uh, like KMFDM maybe a little bit. But as usual, you know, he'll come in with some super bright, super jazzy solos and uh, make things funky for a little bit and then kind of tie it all together for a really cool jam. This was written over a two-day span, which is long for him, <laughs> December 7th and 8th of 1997. I never really heard him return to this kind of a sound, so I wonder what he was listening to or what inspired him to go a little bit rock and a little bit dark for a little bit. Just kind of pull away from a lot of the uh, more funky and jazz and blues influenced stuff. But uh, we're going to move on to one of my favorites. This is a super bouncy and bright track. This one's called Cape Horn, and this was written by him in 2002.
All right, that was Cape Horn by Drax, written in 2002, featured on the soundtrack to Break Quest. Another funky disco kind of tune. I think he really likes composing in this style, especially around the like 2001-2002 era. This was written between the 9th and 10th of July in 2002. The thing that really stands out to me in this track, which you don't hear in a lot of his other music, is those really ethereal pads in the background. They sound, I guess in a disco sense, they would sound like uh, like violins, but they're kind of buried in the mix, and they work to kind of fill the space in between the percussion, and it's definitely a disco trope. You hear that a lot in popular disco music like authentic disco music from the 70s but you don't often hear it in video game disco music (laughs) which happens more often than you might think but i think with instrument and channel limitations they often will leave that part out because it's not as integral to disco music as the driving beat the funky bass the lead dance melody so hearing those soft violin pads in the background is is cool it makes it feel a little bit more authentic i really like that i like that he is observant enough about the genre to try to add those elements into his disco stuff and it's great video game music like i think disco is really good video game music and not enough people use it i think maybe because the genre has so much of a era association if you know what i mean like you hear disco you immediately think 70s and if you're not seeing 70s on the screen there's going to be some sort of a disconnect there it's unfortunate because it's really good music to listen to especially while you're playing a video game super bouncy and bright So let's move on from uh, like an authentic genre piece to something that sounds very video gamey, which is interesting for a change. This was written in 2001. It's called A Fragmented Cowboy's Lullaby. Thank you. 
All right, that was A Fragmented Cowboy's Lullaby, written by Drax in 2001. What a unique track, and what a unique name. Like, A Fragmented Cowboy's Lullaby. Is it the cowboy that's fragmented? Or is it the cowboy's lullaby that's fragmented? How are they fragmented? Where's the lullaby part? This doesn't really sound like a lullaby to me. I don't know. He didn't really give much of an explanation for it in the notes for the music. I I, I like it, and I think it sounds video gamey because it reminds me of music used in lighthearted humorous video games. You know, composers like to use strange sounds in their compositions, especially like for ridiculous Japanese video games. And this one has a lot of, I guess the best way I can describe it is croaky (laughs) sounds. They sound like frogs. It's a really interesting instrument to use, but it uses it very effectively. And I think maybe the cowboy part has something to do with the fact that it sounds a little like a train at the beginning. I don't know, but it's it's got a kind of a gallopy, trainy. Maybe it's more of a gallop now that I'm thinking about it. Maybe that's where the cowboy thing came from, like riding on a horse. And then, of course, it gets really funky and he starts soloing and it takes on a very different characteristic and then kind of wraps back around to that froggy (laughs) instrumentation and back to a little bit of silliness and then goes into the loop so uh this one plays early on in the game and often this is one of the tracks i most closely associate break quest with and Since a lot of the levels are kind of bright, silly, and funny, this one ends up playing in a whole bunch of them. So we're going to transition a little bit away from music that Drax has composed. I wanted to feature the other two composers on this show a little bit, since they do have a couple of tracks that are featured in the game. And it's a good opportunity to get you guys familiar with a a couple of uh, other demo sceners, even if they are all from Maniacs of Noise. I mean, Your Own Tell is not a unknown name by any stretch, but you guys might have heard a lot of video game music by him. So here's an opportunity to listen to a couple of demo scene tracks, at least ones that I am familiar with. But we are going to transition slowly. And by that, I mean the next track that I'm going to feature was written by Drax, but it's a cover of a song that Euro and Tell, aka Wave, wrote earlier. So this is a song called Noisy Pillars 2001, and it is a cover of a song that Euro and Tell wrote for the C64 back in 1987. And we'll talk a little bit more about the process behind this when we come back.
All right, thank you for staying tuned to the VG Embassy. That was Noisy Pillars 2001 by Drax and Wave. This is one of what I think is Drax's best sounding compositions for sure. The arrangement of this track is phenomenal. The instruments are perfectly selected. It is just driving. It doesn't feel like a mod track or tune at all. It feels like, you know, somebody was just composing without any restrictions whatsoever. I love how it ends with that little, like, arpeggio that just fades, and what he does is he just takes that last pattern of music and repeats that pattern over and over again. It's pattern number 15. It just goes 15, 15, 15, but each time it lessens the volume a little bit until it just completely fades out. I thought that was a really cool way to end the track. And uh, he's got some copious notes in this one. So Noisy Pillars 2001 was originally composed by Euro Intel, as I mentioned. And uh, in the notes, he says, rearranged and further composition by Thomas Mogensen, a.k.a. Drax. This module is based on an old C64 tune Euro composed in 1987 called Noisy Pillars Number 1. I added some things to the original arrangement, some things, and uh, from song position 0A, I added something which hasn't got anything to do with the original C64 tune. Started August 22nd, 2001, completed August 23rd, 2001. The interesting thing here is that the Noisy Pillars tune that Drax covered here is actually song number three and not Noisy Pillars one, like he mentions in the notes. This appeared in a one-file C64 demo of the same name, released by a demo group called Scoop. Charles Deenan, who was later a founding member of Maniacs of Noise, wrote most of the code for the demo, and Tell wrote three pieces of music for it. So if you were to uh, rip the sound files, this would be number three in the SID file. So uh, what I thought I'd do is maybe share a little bit of the original Commodore 64 tune that your own tell wrote so you guys can uh, get a little feel for what Drax added to the composition. So let's take a listen to uh, a snippet of Noisy Pillars number three, composed by your own tell on the C64. That's it. That's the whole tune. So you can tell that Drax added a lot more to it. And I really also like that after the uh, the full phrase of the initial lead instrument, where it changes key, in the remake that Drax does, he adds some more backing instrumentation to that. And of course, that would be much more difficult to do on the C64 with only three channels of audio. But when Drax does it, it not only lifts upward, but it also feels way more powerful with that extra oomph coming up from the backing instrumentation. So really well done. There's a couple of really nice dynamic rests with the reverb kind of 
you hear that that snare kind of like echo out during the rest and then it picks back up again and happens a couple times and then at the end of course Drax just decides he wants to go crazy and do a little soloing and none of that appeared in the original so I feel like this was a good track to show off because it really shows how he can take an existing decent you know the original is not bad at all as a Commodore 64 track it's great especially for one composed as early as 1987 but to cover it and just enhance it and take it to a much higher level it's really cool to kind of experience that like I said, I was using this song to kind of transition from some Drax tunes into a couple of other tunes from the other composers before we close out the show. We will return to Drax. We're going to play the show out with a, uh, a final Drax composition. So we're not saying goodbye to him just yet, but we're going to say hello to Wave himself, Mr. Euro and Tell. And uh, first up, we're going to listen to a track called In My Life, My Mind. And he wrote this one in 1999. Be right back.
All right, that was In My Life, My Mind by Wave, written in 1999. Later featured in the 2004 game Break Quest. You see a little bit more of the uh, classic demo scene roots in this track than uh, some of Drax's stuff. This one's got a little bit of a retro feel to it. It's got not one, but two <laughs> layers of arpeggios going on. One of which feels uh, a little bit more like a modern synth, and the other one has more of a like a square wave feel to it. But they both complement each other really well. They don't always play over each other at the same time either. So it fills things out quite nicely, I think. It's also a really long track. It's almost five minutes long which is almost double <laughs> the length of Drax's longest tunes. But it's a, it's a more spread out kind of a track. It's got lots of space in between his solos. It's a much more mellow, kind of relaxing style song. And I think there's a reason for that. This song in the notes, Wave writes, this song is written for my girlfriend, Shine. Also in memory of her mother, may she rest in peace. So. This was kind of a heartfelt gift to his girlfriend who had just lost her mom. And that makes a lot more sense to me now, you know? <laughs> it's it's weird playing a video game to a song that was gifted to somebody in memory of a lost parent, but I didn't know that when I was playing it at the time. And to be fair, the levels that this track are associated with are normally uh, a little bit more ethereal and laid back, kind of like this track was as well. This was one of the only tunes on the soundtrack to not be an official Maniacs of Noise release. This was actually a Five Musicians release, or an FM release. This was a secondary group that Wave was a part of. And so the Five Musicians were Basshead, Huns, Melody, Necros, and of course, Wave. He does thank Drax and Laxity in the music comments, though, as well as a large list of his family members and friends. So he was, of course, acknowledging his membership in Maniacs of Noise with his friends in there as well. This was started on September 8th, 1999 and finished October 8th, 1999. He works a little bit slower than Drax, but can't hold that against him because Drax is an absolute machine when it comes to cranking out tunes. So uh, a month feels like eons compared to how long it takes Mogensen to work on stuff. So uh, just a little bit about your own tell. You know, he did write some video game music as well. A bunch of Commodore 64 games, Combat Crazy, Cybernoid, Cybernoid 2, Myth History in the Making, Robocop 3, Rubicon, worked at Funcom, which was a video game developer in Norway. In 2014, he uh, joined up with Swedish singer and songwriter Tess Fries and formed the pixel pop music duo Tess and Tell, and uh, they had six releases between 2015 and 2016 under that name, and then just so many video game soundtracks for everything from the C64, a Master System, NES, even a couple of CDI games he wrote music for. Definitely one of the most influential figures in European demo scene and game music out there. It feels funny talking about him as kind of a side story to Drax, uh, but maybe one day I'll I'll give him a spotlight and uh, do a show featuring music, you know, specifically from him. So, hey, anybody listening, if you are a uh, a big Your Own Tell fan and you'd like to come on and chat with me about his tunes, hit me up. We can uh, we can get something going. That would be fun. All right, so we got one more track from him on the list. This is called The Home Visit, and uh, this was written in 1996. Let's go home.
Welcome Home, that was the home visit by Wave, aka Euro Intel, written in 1996. This track seems like, to me anyway, it starts off with Euro Intel at the composition helm, but that B section really feels like Drax to me. The layered arpeggios kind of stop, and you get that funky bass with those solos over it. It just feels really similar to what we've been listening to throughout the majority of this podcast. Wave doesn't credit Drax at all for the writing credits in the notes for this particular song. So I'm I'm guessing that he would have, you know, had he helped out on the track. So instead, I just feel like maybe Wave is kind of aping Drax's style for a little bit. Or maybe it was the other way around. Who knows? Uh, I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg in this part. But uh, I really like this one. It is just a very well-produced composition. I think one of the things that Wave really excels at maybe a little more than Drax, is mixing. He knows when to hold back the volume and the velocity of some instruments and let the other ones kind of shine through a little bit more. I feel like Drax pushes everything to the front a little bit. And when you're working in like funk or disco, that works great. When you're slowing things down and getting a a little bit more of a relaxing feel, having all those instruments front and center, uh, you get kind of a disconnect. It feels a little overwhelming, but then trying to be relaxing at the same time. And uh, Wave just has a better feel for where to put instruments in the mix. It's just my opinion. But I'd love to have a conversation about that if you have a different opinion on that. Um, speaking of opinions, I'd love to uh, hear what you guys think about this music. If you are not familiar with Demo Scene, are you getting more interested in hearing some more music from some demo scene composers. Uh, I'd love to point you to some of my favorite episodes of Impulse Project if you wanted to reach out to me and ask. And uh, would you like to see more episodes of the VG Embassy featuring video game music by demo scene composers? I would love to kind of moosh two of my interests together and visit more themes like this. There's actually a sequel to this game, though not by the same developer, called Break Quest Extra Evolution, which does include music by individuals in the demo scene. It's not necessarily Fast Tracker 2 music, but if you guys are interested, I could possibly do a show on that as well. I have not played the game myself, but I've listened to a sample of the soundtrack, and it is lovely. I just don't have a Vita where I can, you know, experience the game. Always happy to share good music from soundtracks, though. All right, so we've got one last track before we uh, play our outro track. And this is the one and only track from Laxity that we're going to be featuring on the show. He only had two pieces of music in the game. This one's called Hypnetic. And this was composed by Laxity in 1997.
All right, that was Hyponetic by Laxity, written in 1997. A much darker song. And this is why I think Laxity didn't have a lot of music in this game, because uh, his style, while certainly in line with my tastes, (laughs) didn't really match up too well with the feel of the game, which was a little brighter, a little more energetic. Laxity likes to write in drum and bass and kind of an ethereal trip hoppy style. Lots of really strange sound effects. Parts of this reminded me of the music that plays in the caves in like the Earthbound and Mother series. Uh, Again, very ethereal, little like tuning in a ham radio sound effects and just, I don't know, makes the listener like want to tune in and like figure out what the composer is trying to do and then the beat finally catches and it moves on. It's really interesting stuff. I really like Laxity's stuff. Not featuring him last because it's least, simply because, you know, there's only one or two tracks available to uh, to choose from, so I wanted to go out with kind of a, an interesting note. His real name is Thomas Peterson. He's also from Denmark. Among, uh, among all the tracks, this one, Hyponetic, and another one called Rocket Dancing were in the full soundtrack. Mainly Laxity was a C64 musician and coder. He actually wrote a few C64 music editors and players himself, one as recently as 2006 when he released a program called Sid Factory, which was a app for playing music directly on the Commodore 64. Folks, that is the show. That's all the music I've got for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Like I said, if you want to hear more of this, let me know. I can supply the full soundtrack to you. If you want to hear more demo scene music on the show, I will definitely work that in, as long as there's some sort of video game music association there. You know, I don't want to go too far outside of VGM, being the VG Embassy and all. Maybe if uh, a lot of the patrons are interested and want me to do some solo demo scene only shows to show off some of my favorite recent pickings for uh, for demo scene tracks that don't have video game music associations maybe if uh you're a subscriber i can uh, make some exclusive demo scene shows that might be fun I know this was a very music-focused show. I don't want that to take away from the fact that Break Quest is a fantastically fun game. It will run on potato computers <laughs> and computers with giant video cards running the latest Windows 10 build like mine. It's a very well-crafted game. I've never had it crash on me. It takes up very little space, too. It's an expertly crafted, fun title that I think you should check out. So please do so. And speaking of patrons, I would, of course, like to thank all the patrons that have hung on. (laughs) I've kind of deactivated my Patreon lately, and uh, I appreciate all of you who are still on my Patreon. I've done some refunds. I've done some uh, delays as far as because I don't want to charge you guys for, you know, extra stuff that I haven't been putting out simply because I just haven't been either in the headspace to do it or haven't had the physical ability to do it in real life but like i said i'm really looking to get some more stuff done if not to necessarily fulfill the tiers to at least give you guys some extra content and uh, show my appreciation for all of you and of course one of the ways i show appreciation is to call you out at the end of the show so let's start with that at our tourist level of course Cameron Childs, aka Bruce Irons of the Mad Gear Band, Chris Murray, the last weekend of VGM Fight Club, Bedroth from the Very Good Music Podcast, at our VG Emissary tier, Chris Myers, Chris Steenerson, Gannon Eleven, and Jordan Worma from the Table to Stage Podcast, Kyle Kroll, and The Dyad. Our audio attache members, Cameron Worma, Carlos from the Heroes 3 Podcast, Scott McElhone, and Dan Lawton. At our special agent tier, Ryan Steele and Volt Supreme of Volt Supreme's VGM Dream Stream Machine. And our VG Ambassadors. Newcomer, frankly, Zappa, thank you so much for becoming a VG Ambassador. Truly means a lot to me, and it's very appreciated. And, of course, the patron saint of all VGM podcasts, Alex, the messenger, messenger. 
I'd also like to thank Indira for the art and Trevin Hughes, a.k.a. Dread, for the podcast theme song. If you want to find me on the web, go to vgmbc.com. That's where you'll find a link to my Discord, where you can hang out with me, VG Ambassadors, friends, and family, and chat about VGM, real life, video game life, etc., etc., etc. Or head over to Twitter at the VG Embassy and say hi. And uh, you can also obviously find us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play Music. Uh, am I forgetting any? I don't know. Uh, basically, anywhere you can find podcasts, you'll find the VG Embassy. We are everywhere. As promised, I will play you guys out with another Drax tune. This one's called The Quest. It was written in 1997. It's the first piece of music he ever entered in a competition, namely a party called The Party. Somehow, the song never got played at the party, unfortunately, and wasn't entered for voting. (laughs) But the details are murky on why, which really sucks. Like, imagine writing what you think is a fantastic piece that you want to submit to a demozine party, and they forget to play it. I think uh, based on this track, which you'll hear soon, it probably would have won, too, which is a shame. Um, I'm pretty sure this is the track that plays during the ending scene of the game once you beat all 100 levels. It's been a long time since I finished the game, and I recently got a new computer, And I thought I had backed up all my game saves, but I guess this game saves in a folder that's different from all of my other games. And I went to uh, start up the game shortly before recording the show to verify where this song plays and realized that uh, all of my save information was gone. So, oh shucks, guess I gotta play the whole game again. (laughs) It's long, but absolutely fantastic track. I think it fits wonderfully as an outro to the show. So please enjoy. We'll see you, I don't know, maybe in a month, maybe sooner. Uh, I've been coming up with uh, ideas for Logan to come back on the show, and uh, he's got a a couple of ideas he's got to decide between so we can get together and share another fun episode of the VG Embassy. So again, thank you guys for listening, and I will see you next time.